Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm Henry Patel. I'm from Jamf. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here. Um, today, in this session, I want to introduce someone that some of you have seen in the past. Specifically, 2015 was his first time here at JNUC, made a big splash, or maybe a small splash. Um, you know, at th that time, the session was uh, called Zero and to 30,000 max in six months, and literally it was, it was that fast, and how at that time IBM had brought in the Mac Choice program and spun it up very quickly and deployed at scale. And so now we have Fletcher back here, um, and he's going to talk about, um, you know, the Mac and how he has brought Mac Choice, or at least how he's continued the Mac Choice at Cisco. So without further ado, let me bring Fletcher on stage. Thanks, Henry. There'll be a, there'll be a Q and A at the end, so just uh, make sure you put your questions in the app. Thank you. All right, Jamf Nation. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here today. As Henry said, this is a kind of a uh, special venue for, for me, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, really glad to be able to be here and share with you some of the great work that our Mac team has been leading, many of whom are here in the audience, um, and uh, I'm sure you'll have sessions with some of them and have time to meet with them as well. And as Henry said, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So uh, a little bit about me, you know, um, really I grew up in a family that is more Entertainment is the family business, and so I spent a lot of time growing up on movie sets and uh, have a couple credits in IMDb as Thanksgiving guest number three, those kind of roles, and um, worked as a writing intern at the David Letterman Show and the Conan O'Brien Show. Um, but I always had this love of technology, and all of that was before I realized that my real passion in life seemed to be middle management at huge companies. and. Uh, and so when I graduated from college, uh, moved out to the West Coast and uh, worked at Walmart.com. I came into Walmart.com as an uh, IT systems administrator, got Microsoft certified, got Cisco certified, uh, became an engineering manager, uh, and then eventually went over to IBM where uh, I eventually became CIO, uh, was CIO of IBM for about four years. and. Um, uh, with, with the help of a great team, led the Mac Choice program at IBM, and then more recently joined Cisco about um, two years and change ago, and I'm now CIO at Cisco. So uh, Cisco is about 85,000 full-time regular employees, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 contractors. So from an IT perspective, um, our team supports about 137,000 people worldwide doing business in close to 100 countries. The IT department between regulars and contractors is about 10,500 people, uh, about a $1.4 billion budget. And uh, you can see some of the stats there, but you know, 4,000 applications. Um, so we look probably like you know, a lot of large companies. Um, all large enterprises have security as top of mind. Everybody's under some sort of cyber threat to varying degrees. And as you would expect, you know, uh, Cisco attracts a lot of cyber attention, and uh, advantage continues to go to adversaries, not good actors. You know, we have to be right all the time. They just have to get it right once. And so uh, a lot of time and attention goes into making sure that we've got our trust boundaries shored up and that we understand our environment better than uh, the apex predator type of adversaries that are trying to break into it. But you can see some of the... Uh, stats here, you know, 8 trillion events, 47 terabytes of traffic analyzed in a given 24-hour time period, uh, millions of DNS queries uh, analyzed, and, and many more blocked. So um, lots of focus on security. This is how we've divided up the uh, IT landscape. You know, you can see um, you, you've got kind of the employee IT in the workplace as a service bucket, but also procurement, supply chain, manufacturing sales and marketing systems, security, network engineering, uh, what else do we have in there? Enterprise architecture. Um, you might notice there is a design and user experience team. That's a new function for Cisco IT. That's something that um, we created really to reflect our 
focus on the employee experience and leading with design and everything that we do. We spend a lot of time actually thinking about uh, IT and technology as a driver of and enabler of culture. And uh, you know, your culture is really kind of the only unique thing that you have. Over time, people steal your technology or they try to, but it's pretty hard to steal somebody's culture. And if you think about culture being a function of how work gets done, the shortest path to engaging employees is what's in their hand or what's on their desk. And so how well we're doing our jobs in delivering IT services to our people is not trivial. It's actually core to creating an environment where talented people want to work and enabling people to do their best work and to just take friction out of the system. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about, this, you know, this is sort of a special uh, venue for me and a special event, and it was a time of reflection. And I was thinking about all of the problems that we've had to solve when we try to bring in a choice program and offer Max as choices to employees, resolving sort of the delta between what a consumer might care about and what a CIO or an IT manager or an IT professional cares about um, has, has really been sort of the focus of a lot of these programs if you sort of look at it a different way. I uh, asked ChatGPT, what does a CIO do? Which, uh, <laughs> which hopefully my boss does not see that, but, uh, uh, and this is what came back, and it's actually not a bad description of sort of the high level uh, things that you care about in the CIO role. Um, you know, you've got budgeting and resource management, security, compliance, SOX, audit, um, uh, strategy and planning, communicating with your, our customers or sort of internal stakeholders and other parts of the business. Um, and then leading a team and probably affecting some sort of transformation for the company. But um, if you really kind of group these things up, a big part of the job really could be categorized as risk management. Uh, and that's not a good or a bad statement, it just is, right? Like the part of this function, you, you're carrying a lot of the systems that have material risk for the company in terms of reporting. Uh, financials accurately and sustainment of legacy systems and maintaining operations 24-7 and everything else that goes in between. Now, what you hope is that a good CIO has time to focus on these other things that differentiate your environment in some way and really work in service of employees and take seriously that this is a servant role, that when you're doing it properly, you really are trying to walk a mile in someone else's shoes and take friction out of the system. But I can't focus on those things if these other things are not well taken care of. If I am besieged with you know, problems in that upper kind of risk area, there isn't the bandwidth or the um, willingness to focus on these more transformative parts of what we're trying to do. So that stuff's got to be looked after. If you think about, you know, that's, that's a sort of very different list than what a consumer cares about, right? A consumer probably cares about that the new laptop's a little bit lighter, the weight, the battery life, the Apple Silicon performance, the better together story of Apple TV and your watch, you know, getting access to the latest features and things, those sort of drive consumer behavior. But what the CIO cares about is a completely different list of things, and there's really no overlap. Um, you know, I'm looking at how are we gonna afford this? Do we have the ability to comply with all of our corporate policies and regulatory obligations? Uh, do we have the skills in the team necessary to be able to do this? Um, will we have applications that would be problematic? How are we gonna get support? Um, are we gonna be reliably able to source these products? You know, it's, I, I don't wanna have orders canceled all of a sudden as soon as new things come out. Um, I've gotta make the CFO, the head of HR, and the CEO happy. And then quite honestly, just not getting fired. The half-life of a CIO is on average about three to five years and less at tech companies. So that's sort of the, the care abouts. But even if you can sort of make it past the CIO, you still got to deal with somebody like this. Somewhere in the organization. This is a real picture that I took uh, in the office. It was not at Cisco, but I'm not going to say where it was. Uh, this person, by the way, is reading something called a newspaper. That's where they used to print yesterday's news on paper and then ship it out on trucks. 
you know, but uh, what that person likely cares about is some overlap with what the CIO cares about, but sort of a deeper dive on it, right? Their skills gaps on the team, the ability to get enterprise support, uh, warranty coverage, uh, is it gonna integrate with my identity provider? How am I gonna do MDM properly? You know, you're sort of breaking this problem down into the real things that you have to solve that are the delta between the way it ships and the shrink wrap box to the way that you need to make it work in the enterprise. And so everybody in this room is part of solving that problem, which has been hugely beneficial for um, hundreds of thousands of employees who have benefited from it, but that's, that's really kind of the exercise. And, um, you know, I've, I've bet my career on, um, on Apple twice, once with the Mac at IBM program and now with the, with the Mac at Cisco program. And it wasn't like it was some huge leap of faith. I mean, I, I had a lot of um, confidence and belief that if we could get these things into the hands of people, goodness would follow because I know what it has done for me in my personal life. And I want that for anybody, that, anybody else that wants that in their work environment. Um, if you think about how much friction is in our everyday work lives, and, and, and how much using Apple products has helped in your personal life. You know, I want that for our, our work life as well. But it is about more than just buying a device and, and putting it out there and hoping for the best. Everyone in this room knows, you know, we've got to figure out how to make that work from uh, a finance and procurement perspective, an Apple Care perspective, how, uh, new employee onboarding, provisioning, device management, how you get support, how you manage these things, how you make the applications work, um, and then building a kind of life cycle of the device, everything from new hire onboarding, how you communicate with people, how you build this kind of consumerized experience around the communications that you get, uh, how you set up a device, how you get access to the tools and applications that you need to be productive in your job, how you get support, and then eventually how you uh, either get a new one or return it if you exit the company. But that sort of full life cycle of stuff is the part that's not written down anywhere and, and we've all got to figure out. And, um, and, and that was really sort of the, the exercise of the Mac program, which um, as Henry said, you know, it, it generated a lot of interest. When, when we came here and shared the great work that the team had done, and we were able to go from zero to 30,000 and really scale it for a number of reasons. Um, you know, zero touch cloud-based enrollment and, and some good engineering work. Um, it, it was exciting. Mark Andreessen, and Phil Schiller tweeted about it. But he actually said I was one of the funniest VPs at IBM, which is immediately, you know, that's a pretty low bar, but still, uh, I'll take it. And, uh, and I think the reason was at the time when you would say, I want to offer Mac as a choice to employees, what you would get is this. They cost more money. We don't really know how to manage them. Uh, we're gonna have to refactor all these applications that won't work. Um, we're trying to find ways to save money, not spend more money. And yeah, we know the Mac is a desirable asset that people want and people like it, but we, we, you know, we're not idiots, we just can't afford it. And so, um, while we were trying to figure this out, I had an opportunity to spend some time with Apple. And Apple's kind of an interesting enterprise, right? They're, they're a large enterprise. They've got complicated businesses. They've got retail stores. They've got manufacturing. They've got supply chain. They've got increasingly looking like a bank with the credit card stuff. They've got cloud services. Um, they, they've got a lot, of, lot going on. They care a lot about intellectual property and privacy and security. And so there's actually a lot of commonality between the problems that they would be encountering as an enterprise and, and all of us deal with. Um, but when I was there, one of the things I observed is that they're managing a large number of devices with a lot less people than you would normally see in a Windows environment. So how are they doing that? And so we kind of looked at that and said, you know, how can we kind of take what we're seeing here and synthesize that back into our environment and make it work for us? Uh, and this was at IBM. And what we came back with is, is really what I think we're seeing here is a three legs of a stool approach. Give people the best devices, manage those devices in a modern way, and enable self-service in the environment. Give people the best devices for them and give them max. Don't buy the cheapest stuff you can find. Manage it in a modern way. Man, get out of this whole imaging business and just do enrollment over the air with um, Apple Business Manager and Jamf 
and kind of manage these things the way you were more used to managing phones. Um, and then make it easy for people to self-resolve problems when they have them. And when you do those things correctly, you can then afford to staff and create a support function and a help desk that's totally driven on delivering a great customer experience to people instead of things like ticket volume and speed to closure because there's just fewer problems coming into the environment. And so we, we, we felt intuitively that we would be able to put together a, a real total cost of ownership instead of focusing on the cost of acquisition of the asset. And if we could really accurately capture what all of us kind of intuitively know to be true, that these things just break less often, they seem to require less support, uh, they're easier to use, two thirds of the cost of an asset in the enterprise over three or four years is in the operating and maintenance of it. And so if we could somehow capture those costs properly and, and really sort of figure this out, you know, uh, what's the residual value of the asset? How many people are we going to need to manage it? What are the uh, third-party software things we don't need to buy because we can take advantage of Mac OS in, in, in uh, interesting ways? And bundle that all up together, and we'd be able to make a pretty compelling business case. And we were. Every Mac that we were buying was saving uh, several hundred dollars over three or four years compared to the equivalent Windows PC. And so that was kind of, uh, I think, really interesting for people and generated a lot of excitement. So now let's talk about Cisco. Mission of Cisco is to enable people to do the best work of their lives. Um, this idea that you cannot have this wonderful experience at home in your personal life and then this terrible experience at work, um, you know, there's just less and less patience for that. The idea that your best experience today is sort of meets minimum tomorrow. That's, that's a moving goalpost of what good looks like. And that things that are uh, well designed don't need a lot of pushing on people. You don't need adoption and enablement and videos and hand holding. Uh, if, if, if things are easy to use, uh, people will pull it from you. You don't have to push it on them. When I first joined Cisco, um, they said, would you like to have a CVO? And I said, what is a CVO? And they said, a CVO is a Cisco virtual office. And basically, it makes it where you don't need the VPN. It extends the corporate network into your home office. And I said, that does sound cool. I would like a CVO. And this is what I got. And I thought, well, it's kind of cool. I definitely have joined a network company. Uh, but the instructions start out by telling you what not to do. And uh, this seems kind of like a lot to ask of your average employee. Uh, and so we thought, you know, with the help of the team, let's put together a really great, highly designed experience for hybrid work. It was sort of the, the time of tail end of the pandemic and being more flexible in our work. Um, and how do we close the gap between being in the office and being remote in a way where people are not disadvantaged in their career, it's not a less than experience, and how can we really kind of think about that in a thoughtful way? And so we came up with this thing called the um, Cisco IT Hybrid Worker Bundle. Let's see if I can get the video to play. There we go. So uh, it shows up in a box. It's kind of like a layer cake. Um, and when you open it up, if you're a new hire, it has the person's badge at the top. Uh, and then as you, you take apart the layers in the first top layer is the, the Mac, the keyboard, the trackpad. And then underneath that is um, some Cisco equipment, a security appliance, and also a wireless access point. Um, and so that can be hooked up to your existing network at home, or you can replace your entire home network. Um, and uh, we are then able to proactively monitor that environment for uh, reliability, uptime, performance, and protect the whole home and everything in it uh, with, a, with a whole series of um, Cisco security software and services that would be appropriate for the biggest enterprises. We also send a WebEx collaboration device. This is called a, a WebEx desk. Um, it's a kind of purpose-built, hardware-optimized WebEx device that you can also use as an external monitor. Um, doesn't sound like such a huge deal, but it really does make the meeting experience different. You can see when people are not paying attention and when their eyes are averting and you can read body language and you just have a much more fulsome remote experience. So that um, is something that we're really proud of. Let's see here. There we go. Here's a, uh, another thing that we recently rolled out is we call these the help zone kiosks. 
The idea is you go into the office. If you need to get support on something, you can walk in there, remotely connect to an advisor. Uh, if we can't fix the problem on the phone, we can remotely open one of those lockers and give you a replacement laptop. Uh, you can also use that to pick up and drop off your laptop. You can swipe your badge and buy accessories that are commonly needed or PPE if you're in the office. Um, and so this is just another sort of thinking of the return to office experience differently. Um, sometimes I get asked, you know, well, why do you need to do any of this stuff? Why don't you just use the device the way it comes uh, from the manufacturer? And it's because everybody in this room knows there are things that we need to do in an enterprise that a consumer doesn't need to do. Uh, it's not enough for me to just say, I know that the Mac OS is secure. I have to be able to prove that. I have to be able to produce artifacts that demonstrate that we're complying with all of our policies and obligations. And be able to do things like asset management and remote wipe and enforce password policies, enforce screensaver policies, um, um, you know, all the things that we have to do to manage the fleet for an enterprise. The way that we do that at Cisco is uh, from an MDM perspective, in tune for the PCs, Jamf for the Macs, Cisco Meraki for the mobile devices, um, and then also uh, Duo for MFA and Cisco Secure Endpoint also on top of there as well, and AnyConnect for VPN. Um, so this probably doesn't look too different than many of your environments. But that sort of same philosophy of give people the right devices, manage it in a modern way, and enable self-service in the environment became the design points as well for our Mac at Cisco program. Uh, the picture on the right you see there are some of our local Austin support team. That was another really important thing is, you know, hiring people who are as passionate about the Mac as the people who are going to be using it, as opposed to just tacking it on to another device that someone else is handling in a call queue. Um, getting that great experience, and, and uh, a lot of this team, I think, is actually here today. So, um, Also supporting the latest Apple Silicon Macs. And um, you know, we, we've standardized on Apple Silicon for our Mac fleet and now M2. Uh, and the, the, uh, the team's done some great work on the enrollment process, making it where uh, you very quickly get to the desktop. We, we launch WebEx. They've done some integrations into WebEx where we're able to message with employees about what is happening on their endpoint while the enrollment finishes. Um, so let's talk about some of the results. This is sort of the fun part. Um, you know, did all this work? There was already, by the way, a fairly significant sized Mac fleet at Cisco. I think it, you know, it was around 30,000, and over the past few years, it's, it's, it's grown up to 60,000. So let me share some of the metrics with you. Today, about 60% of Cisco uses a Mac. If you're curious how that breaks down by job role, uh, here you go. We've got to get after these finan financial analysts, find out what's going on there. <laughs> Um, but 88% of the employees that are from companies that Cisco acquires are already using a Mac. And 24% of PC users, when it comes time to get a new device, are choosing to switch over to a Mac. So you can sort of project out where, where this is headed. Um, looking at the TCO, the team has really put a lot of work into building a TCO that's really looking at all of the end-to-end -end costs for a large enterprise to manage these devices for uh, the life of the asset. And there have been other TCO calculators, but they tend to be from one vendor or another, and they don't really capture sort of all of your costs. And someone tells you you're gonna, you know, you're gonna save $8 trillion in productivity, that's not really helpful. I need to look at sort of hard benefit. Uh, how am I gonna take this case to the CFO and make this work? Um, and so, in this TCO calculator that we built, we look at leasing versus buying, by country or geography, by operating system, by employee type, regular versus contractor, uh, the entire software stack of third-party software that we need to buy to make this work, the hardware costs, the residual value, the support costs, how many engineers do we need to make it work, kind of the whole sort of you know, cradle to grave, how do we make this program work? Um, and, uh, oh, I, I should have shown this. There's a little bit of an animation about how it works. Um, you can see, yeah, there we go. There's a sort of instructions for it, so people are using it the same way. Uh, you enter in the numbers, device counts, where these uh, devices are going to be located, whether you're um, 
um, you know, mandatory software that's needed and so on. Um, so it's a very thorough piece of work on the TCO calculator. And the um, good news is that as of this morning or yesterday, we have permission to open source that, and that will be out on GitHub. So hopefully that will help um, as, as you try to put business cases together. I do think it's a really thorough sort of IT lens of how to do TCO analysis, and it's not really vendor specific. You can do uh, Microsoft Cloud PC, Linux, Mac, PC, buy, lease, three years, four years, all the software, it's all in there, so it's very helpful. Um, however, for us, when we put in our numbers, the TCO for the Mac is between $148 and $395 less than an equivalent PC over three years. Uh, the way that that breaks down is, you can see here, hardware, software, engineering resources, and support uh, by each of the devices that we're comparing, in this case, the X1 Carbon, to the MacBook Pro 15-inch, um, or the P1 to the MacBook Pro 16-inch. It gets better if you look at it over four years. Uh, from a cost perspective, it may not be better to keep it for four years, but you do save between $245 and $561, depending on which model of Mac you're buying. Here's the detailed breakdown of that, and from hardware, software, uh, engineers, help desk, um, uh, by device type over four years. If we look at Linux, um, by the way, it's about $1,634 less over three years. Now that number will improve in the sense that it won't be quite that expensive. That's partly because our Linux program is new. When you start something, the costs are a little bit higher in the beginning, but it's probably going to settle out somewhere in the five to six hundred dollar range. Uh, here's the, the Linux chart today. And then what about um, virtual PC? What about something like Microsoft Cloud PC? Um, you know, that is sort of interesting as well. That's about $183 uh, more expensive than a Mac. And that doesn't include the cost of some sort of computer that you need to access that thing on the cloud in the first place. And uh, this is how that breaks down. In terms of um, our support costs, we need about a third fewer engineers to manage the Mac environment as a sort of number of devices per engineer stat. And then, you know, you don't just do all this because it's going to save money. You, you know, we're doing this because we think it's going to giving people choice in the tool that they're using, you know, eight to 16 hours a day is important. Pe people want to be able to uh, choose their prefer preferred tool and it will have all these kind of wonderful business outcomes. If we look at um, satisfaction with IT, so this is sort of responses to the question, are you satisfied with the quality of service that the IT department is providing you? It's about 76% for uh, employees that have a Windows PC. It's about 80% for those with a Mac about 83% for those with a Mac and an iPhone. We're a networking company, so we get a lot of network telemetry. And uh, this is sort of especially important in the hybrid world that a lot of us are operating in. And uh, using telemetry off of the Cisco Thousand Eyes agent, we're able to show very consistently uh, the Mac has sign significantly faster DNS lookup times, less packet loss, less jitter, uh, less um, uh, frame buffering, higher wireless signal quality, all things that are going to translate into a better hybrid work and remote meeting experience. If we look at uh, biometrics, that's kind of interesting. Uh, of the machines that are enabled for Windows Hello or Touch ID, about 88% of the Macs that have Touch ID have been set up and enrolled for Touch ID uh, versus just 23% of the Windows Hello enabled PCs being set up and configured properly. And when we, when we go and we ask people why, um, what they tell us is that the experience to set it up is pretty difficult and complicated, and there are some concerns about what is happening with their biometric data, and, um, and some people are just not comfortable doing that. But much higher take up of biometrics, which is good for security on the Mac platform. In terms of um, some business outcomes, 
If you are a salesperson at Cisco and you have a Mac, you have almost 10% more deals created, uh, almost 11% more bookings achieved, and 9.9% um, .9 faster time to close a deal. If you are a software developer, you check in 11.5% more code to GitHub uh, in the same period of time compared to a Windows developer. So, you know, you got to be careful about cause and effect. Does giving someone a Mac make them a better developer? Or do better developers want Mac? I, I don't know, but uh, what I do know is we want to have a choice program. So we get about 12% fewer help desk tickets created on the Mac compared to the PC and about 36% fewer hardware issues reported. What's really interesting is if we look at um, hardware issues of Intel Macs versus Apple Silicon Macs, it's about 4.75 times more hardware issues for the Intel Macs compared to the Apple Macs. And that's not an age of fleet issue where the Intel ones are just getting old. It's in the same initial 24 month time period, uh, many more hardware issues on the Intel Macs. If you break down the tickets that we do receive, about 65% of them really don't have anything to do with the Mac. Those are tickets that would have been open no matter what platform somebody was on, password resets and things like that. Um, of the remaining 35%, uh, you can see the breakdown there between hardware and software, and mostly it's things like cracked screens and OS upgrades. From a security perspective, um, we get nine times fewer virus cases reported on the Mac compared to the PC. We also detect five times fewer cyber threats on the endpoints of Macs compared to Windows. That's based off of the Cisco Secure Endpoint data. Related to that, how long does it take when a new version of an operating system comes out to get to uh, something like 90% you know, of everybody running the current version? Those things look very different on the Windows environment compared to the Mac, right? Within a month of a new Mac OS coming out, we get 90% of people adopting. It takes six months to get to the same milestone in the Windows fleet. So um, one of the other things that, that we've been thinking about and are figuring out how to do now, people really have not changed the way that they think about refreshing employees' devices for decades. They generally do it either by age, you know, we'll do two years, three years, four years. Sometimes you get a place that's sort of progressive and says, we don't have a policy, you can just have a new laptop anytime you like. But it's not the most intelligent way to do it, like a much better way to do this. You know, not everybody perceives getting a new device as a positive event in their life. Uh, a, a pretty good chunk of people just don't even respond when you send them an email saying it's time for a new, a new laptop because they're perfectly happy with the laptop they have and it's working fine. So if we could be smarter about this and take telemetry off of these endpoints and understand when they're working fine and when they're not working fine and when they're exhibiting early indicators of imminent failure, and we would proactively replace those, but otherwise if people are perfectly happy with it, we just leave them with it. You can kind of squeeze this balloon into a different shape and say, actually our policy can be anybody can have a new laptop anytime they want because it's a small percentage of people that actually want to do that but it's the people for whom it most matters. And, and just getting into sort of a more intelligent way about thinking about refreshing the fleet, not based on the age, but based on performance, um, seems to be a much smarter way to do this. The other thing I'd say is, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this over the, the especially during the pandemic, but, but now as we're all kind of back and, and making all these decisions every day in the IT department, they feel very tactical in the moment because you're kind of balancing time, cost, risk. And so it's a, it's a lot of kind of point decisions. How should I set up the VPN? How do I want to make this thing available? How do I want to do new hire onboarding? How, do I gonna, how do I want to configure the MDM? But when you take all those things together, they really kind of form the answer to the question, what is it like to work in this organization? And what you're really doing is defining the future of work and setting the culture of the organization that you're in, and organizations will succeed or fail on the basis of the people that are there. And so how do we all create environments where talented people want to work and feel valued and feel respected? A lot of our work, you know, I, I would argue, um, maybe more than any other of the corporate functions, really impact everybody's day-to-day -day life at work. 
And so I would just in encourage everybody to sort of think of it in those terms that we are really designing the employee experience and the future of work and the decisions that we're all making um, impact everybody in the company. And there's not a lot of roles where that's always true. And so um, to really think of IT as a transformation engine and not as some back office expense, um, a Mac choice program is one of the few things that you can do that is going to save money, make the head of HR happy, make the CFO happy, make employees more productive and happy. Uh, and, and there's just not a lot of things like that. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's always very well received. And then, you know, just kind of bringing security and finance early along. If you're just starting out with a program, uh, you know, getting them in the boat for the vision of what we're going to do and how we're going to have um, a lot of confidence to stand behind the numbers that actually we're going to save cost and improve, improve employee productivity and improve, improve engagement and reduce attrition. Um, those things are all true, but you know, it's sort of helpful to get people lined up around that early. So with that, I think we are going to move into, um, we have a few minutes for Q&A, Henry, is that right? Yes, we do. So thank you, Fletcher. Great job, thank you again. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Um, first question, which is a, a popular, are these slides available anywhere? Well, they've been shown here this morning, so that pretty much wraps up my uh, career. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't, well, I... This is recorded. Yeah, this is recorded, so yeah, they're available So you here. have that. Yeah. Um, you know, there were some uh, more specific questions around you know, how you provide virtual desktop for the Mac. And associated with that, I think, was also around the finance department. You had one of the laggards is the finance department. How do you support, how do you get finance over the line on the Mac, especially, especially because of Excel? Yeah. So I think it's the same as any other department. You got to go and get the details behind what's going on. And often it's some sort of urban legend. You know, we have this, this, this one thing that people say doesn't work, or you know, the manager, the hiring manager is using a Windows PC, and eight years ago when they started, someone told them you should just get a, a PC because things work better. So you know, do, ask to see the facts and the evidence. What is the actual thing that you're trying to do that doesn't work on the Mac? It's okay if people want to use a PC, but if the reason they're not using a Mac is because they're harboring some misconception that something won't work, um, we owe it to them to get to the bottom of that and, and find out whether that's true or not. My experience has been most of the time that is actually not true. Um, more and more the code base for Excel is similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's a pretty small number of cases where someone's got a real concrete example of something that is mission critical, core to their job, they use it all the time and it doesn't work on the Mac. I think that is um, often asserted, much less frequently actually proven which is the reason I really don't like to do big application readiness assessments. That's great if what you're looking for is an excuse not to move forward, because I can save you the effort. The result's going to be there are things that are not compatible. But how do you solve those is sort of the exercise. Great, thank you. Um, one of the other questions that came up was, you know, how do you associate soft costs, right, with the ROI, for the employee experience, reduction in friction, employee delight? Yeah, it's a good question. We should. I should have included some of the soft benefits in here. I've really focused on the hard benefits because those are just completely indisputable. Those are hard costs that we are avoiding or taking out um, and um, you know, making people more productive and happier is important. Um, but it's not part of the TCO calculator and part of that's because when you go and have this conversation with the finance department, sometimes you'll find um, CFOs are, are um, do care about the soft benefits and employee engagement, but sometimes you'll find people say, look, if making people more productive made us more money, the stock would be four times what it is. I, I need to see hard benefits. And those are the harder ones to capture. We know people like the Mac. We know they're happy with it. We know employee engagement goes up. Um, but, but there is a good story to be told, and I have done it in the past around the soft benefits, around attrition and employee engagement and productivity and um, all the other benefits you get from it. But in the TCO calculator is, the hard costs. 
Great, and I think we'll do one more question. I think you already had a slide on this, but it did come up and folks were voting throughout the presentation, which was around you know, uh, applying additional software on the Mac. And I think you, you did talk about that. I think, do you have any other clarification about adding more software atop the Mac OS platform? Yeah, there, I mean, there is some third-party software that we use in our Mac environment as well. But, um, you know, if I compare kind of the software stack that we need for both environments, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot less than, and not having images is a big deal. Um, you know, I think part of the challenge with capturing the PC costs totally is that you almost have to get, like, to my level in the organization before you actually know what your Microsoft spend is. Because they're all rolled up together and so, you know, to other people in the organization, it can appear that Intune is free, as an example, right? It's free if you don't count the 60 million a year we're already paying them. Uh, that's not the real number, I'm making it up. But, but you know, the point is it's, it's all rolled up into your, um, you know, um, in, into your Office 365 subscription or your E3 or whatever you have. And, and so it's harder to deconstruct that. But, um, but there are costs there, and that is also third-party software. And it's just the, the management stack is, is, is not free, right? You've got uh, maybe domain controllers if you're still on-prem. You've got Active Directory in the cloud. You've got or, uh, Intra or Infra, or whatever it's called now, and, um, uh, and, and costs in there as well. And then third-party things that you'd be using for security and compliance and DLP and asset management and... Um, and everything in between. I mean, everyone in this room knows sort of the third party landscape. Great. Well, thank you. That's it for this session. I really appreciate Fletcher coming back here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Here's the question.